All right, welcome to our fourth episode of Chapter 1. And in this episode, well, it's going to be one of the two longest ones. The longest one, obviously, was the scientific method one. And this one's going to be on the characteristics of life. And this would probably be the second most important episode if we were to pick out of this series. All right, so let's get on this one. What are the characteristics of life? And as you can see here, I've got a, a series of green letters here. So I've created one of my patented mnemonic devices. And to remember the characteristics of life, you just want to remember Mr. You Go Re. Mr. You Go Re. All right. The M stands for made of cells. The most basic characteristics of life is you have to be made up of cells. The R is reproduce. Uh, the U is a universal genetic code. Remember, all living things are going to have DNA. And we're going to talk a lot about DNA in this course as we go through the year. Growth and development, we're going to tell you what the difference are between those in an upcoming slide. The O stands for obtain and use material and energy. You've got to take in nutrients, and you're going to use those nutrients to do stuff, and the energy gives you the ability to do stuff. Respond to stimuli. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Basically, a stimulus is something that causes a response. Homeostasis, one of the major vocab and concepts of this chapter and of this course. Uh, we're going to cover that in a little bit more detail, but basically homeostasis means maintaining a constant internal environment. And then a recurring theme, theme evolve. Living things are going to change over time. So let's look at each of these in better detail. Remember, Mr. You go re the characteristics of life. All right, number one, all living things are made up of cells. So anything less than a cell is technically not alive, such as a virus. All right now, uh, living things are either going to be multicellular or unicellular. Okay, one of the things you want to pick up very, very early in this course is that biology is essentially a vocabulary class. If you can understand the vocabulary, you're going to do very, very well in this course. All right? Now, scientific words are always trying to tell you what they mean. So if you're going to understand prefixes, root words, and suffixes, you're going to kill it in this class. All right, so let's look at this one here. Cellular. Guess what that means? Cells. Oh! And of course, multi simply means many. So if you're a multicellular organism, you're going to be made of many, many cells. Now, when you're a multicellular creature, you have to have specialized cells. And specialized cells gives you an advantage over a unicellular creature, which is an organism that's made up of only one. So think of unicycle. There's only one wheel on that cycle. Now let's go back to the specialized cells. Specialized cells are going to have special shapes and therefore special functions. And this is done through a process called, you guessed it, cellular specialization. Or it could be called cellular differentiation because these new cells will have different functions than possibly from your neighbors. All right? We're going to cover that when we get into Chapter 7 and some other later chapters. We're going to revisit this concept of cell specialization. But remember... Multi means many, uh, unicellular means one, all right? So um, anim most animals, all animals are, are multicellular. Think of like protists and bacteria. These guys are unicellular, as you can see down here in this picture. All right, let's clear that stuff out of there. <clears throat> all right, number two, living things reproduce. There's two types of reproduction. Now, let's go back here one step. Okay, let's remember that reproduction means that you're going to make more of your own kind. Now, it comes in two different types, asexual. In this uh, example, or actually in this type of reproduction, the offspring are genetically identical to the parent. So in other words, asexual reproduction is going to produce clones. All right? A clone is something that is genetically identical to the parents. So in other words, the DNA is exactly the same. Now, what's good about asexual reproduction? It's really easy to do. You essentially copy your DNA and you split in half. The cons, and this con is really bad, is that there's no genetic variety. Now, one of the things I want to show you right now is that genetic variety is the raw material for evolution. 
Let's get this caught up in here. Okay. Without genetic variety, it's it's impossible for living things to evolve. All right. And we're going to get back to that in some later chapters. When we, we This will be in semester two when we talk about evolution. But I want to plant that seed in your head. Genetic variety is the raw material for evolution. All right. Sexual reproduction is actually the preferred way for most living things to reproduce because it creates genetically different. Remember this genetic variety up in here? One of the best ways to create genetic variety is to reproduce sexually. Now, the pros, I just said it right here, genetic variety. The cons, it's much harder to do. When you do asexual reproduction, that's just with yourself. Remember, it's got two steps. Number one, copy your DNA. Number two, uh, split in half and make sure that each half gets a copy of that DNA. With sexual reproduction, that's going to require another individual because one organism is going to have to create um, sperm cells and the other organism is going to have to create egg cells and then those two things are going to have to come together to produce the new baby. So obviously, that's a little bit harder to do. All right, so I want you to zoom, I'm going to zoom down here on this picture. Um, this is asexual reproduction. You copy your DNA. You split in half. You make sure that each new offspring uh, has the complete set of DNA that you copied. And then, bam, you now have two. Pretty easy to do. Over here on this picture, this is sexual reproduction. Here you've got the male P file. He's producing the sperm cell. Here's the female P file. She's going to produce an egg cell. When these two things come together, you go through a series of steps. And there you got your little baby. All right, a pea chick. All right, so peacocks, pea hens, pea chicks. A little bit harder to do than this relatively simple process over here. All right, next one. All living things use a universal genetic code, and this would be DNA. Now, we're going to cover DNA in much more detail in other chapters, but I want you to make a note right here. The DNA contains the information to produce proteins. And proteins control all of the chemistry that goes on inside a living thing. So this stuff is really, really important. We're going to have two chapters that are just on DNA coming up this semester. So I'm going to hold off on giving you too much info on that one here. All right, the fourth one is all living things will grow and develop. So we need to know the difference between growth and development. Growth is simply getting bigger. And you're going to get bigger two different ways. You're either going to produce more cells, which is what you do as you're growing. You're right in, you know, as an adolescent, you're in the process of growing right now. And two, you may make the cells that you currently have bigger. All right? Now, there's some limits to cell size, but you can make them a little bigger. Now, development is a change in form and a function. Let me underline that one for you. This one's a change in form and function. <clears throat> so body parts are going to change, and they may develop new um, functions, or they could lose functions. Right? And what's happening is you're having a continued cell specialization where the cells that were not doing much uh, prior to puberty, they're now being kicked into action and they're starting to show their specialized function. All right? So remember, growth simply means getting bigger. Development means changing form. Let's move on to number five. All living things obtain and use materials and energy. Now, the materials are, are your basic biomolecules, which we're going to cover in another chapter um, this semester. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So think of the materials that living things are going to acquire. That's food. All right? So living things need to take in food. Uh, and then that food contains energy, and this energy is the ability to do work. And the energy is really going to be found in chemical bonds. So what's going to happen is when your body needs to store energy, it's going to make chemical bonds. And when it needs to release energy to use it, it's going to break chemical bonds. And we're going to cover that all in detail when we get to our biochemistry stuff, which luckily for you, begins with chapter two, the one right after this one. Right. The characteristics of life, number six and seven. Number six, all living things respond to their environment. A stimulus is some environmental signal that causes a response. You perceive stimuli 
using your five senses. Like if you saw a bus coming at you, hopefully you would respond by getting out of the way. Okay? So um, if you're a cheetah on the African savanna and you see a Thompson's gazelle, the stimulus is that you see a gazelle, your response should be run after it, catch it, and eat it. Because all living things need materials and energy. Now if you're the gazelle and you see the cheetah, you need to start running so that it doesn't catch you. All right. Now, remember we talked about homeostasis on, on a previous episode. Here we're going to look at the definition of it. Um, homeostasis is the process that maintains a constant internal environment. And what we talk about a constant internal environment could be um, concentration of water, it could be pH, it could be temperature, it could be concentration of oxygen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We need to make sure that this internal environment inside a living thing is constant because that way the chemistry of life can occur a lot easier. And when this chemistry gets out of whack, that's what happens. It causes you to get sick, and it also may cause you, if it gets too far out of whack, to perish and pass away. All right? And all living things usually try to want to avoid that dying part. And then finally, the last one is taken as a group, living things evolve. Now, it's not possible for individuals to evolve a population of living things can evolve over time. And we're going to get into what all that means. We get into chapters 15 and 16, which are the evolution ones. Okay. Now, natural selection is the process through which living things evolve. And basically what uh, natural selection works as is um, certain individuals in a population have better traits. Those traits allow them to survive and reproduce more often. They pass on these good traits to their offspring, and over time, more and more individuals are going to have these special traits, and oh, voila, they've evolved. Right? Right. So remember, the characteristics of a life, Mr. Hugo Ri. Um, if you need to watch this episode again, do not hesitate to do so. So until the next time, we're going to catch you on the flip side.